welcome to the ideas talk. I see some familiar faces, people that already come to the ideas store. I see some new faces. I hope you like our venue. And uh, we are a public library, and uh, our um, mission is uh, to foster knowledge, obviously, and printing, and also to connect with the community. And this event seems to tick all the boxes. It is a great pleasure to have Shazia Omar with us today, presenting her book, Dark Diamond. The book is on sale from Brick Lane Books just outside, if you want to purchase it. And also, I've put some books that you can borrow using your idea store card related to the history of the Bengal and to historical fiction and fantasy fiction, because this book is a historical fantasy, which is a very interesting concept. I'm sure we'll hear more about it. And uh, on this note, um, we also have, we will, we will host a, um, a workshop on writing historical fiction. So if you're interested, it's at the end of the month. I've left some leaflets and it's free. So if you're interested in the topic. It is also a pleasure to have Raju Ali with us as a moderator of tonight's event. He is part of Idea Patok, which is our monthly uh, Bengali reading group, run by my colleague Rashid in the shadow down there. And uh, it's on the first Tuesday of every month. You're all invited. Again, it's a free event and it's about culture and it's about connecting with the community. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here today. It's a very important event in terms of the literacy. So myself, uh, Raju Ali, I would like to thank, uh, at the very beginning, the Ida Store for their hospitality, especially the Clara and Rashid Dalal, and also the Brooklyn Cycles, Ahmedullah. Mr. Ahmedullah, thank you very much, once again. So I would like to thank everyone for being here once again. And uh, so today, we invited one of the prominent author of uh, Bengali literature in terms of writing in English, Ms. Sadia Omar. So without further delay, I would like to invite her at the stage. Please give her a big hand. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I, I guess I should uh, get oh. this on, right? to the hole? Yes, there you go. Okay, should I, I'll have to click, so I guess I should. I'll, I'll do it. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so. Sure, or it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So, without further delay, I would like to invite Ms. Shadi Omar to introduce herself and also introduce the book, The Dark Diamond, the event happening here today on behalf of that, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for joining today, um, especially for Rashid Bhai and Ahmedullah Bhai. Thank you so much for organizing this. Where is Ahmedullah Bhai? Ah, oh, there you are. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so I live in Bangladesh, and this is the first time I'm talking in London. So it's really a big honor for me, and I'm very excited to have this opportunity to share my writing with you. And I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Um, so first slide. <laughs> so this is a little bit about me. Um, I'm a yoga teacher. I teach Ashtanga yoga. Next slide. And I work in development. I've been working on eradicating extreme poverty in Bangladesh. I've been working on that for the last 12 years. Right now I'm with UNDP working on the social protection policy. Um, and these are my kids. They're eight and six. Um, so got a little family. So writing, Dark Diamond, writing is not paying the bills, but it's definitely something I'm very passionate about, and it takes up all of my free time, and it's something I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, Dark Diamond is the third book I've written, my second novel, um, and I'll begin with telling you a little, oh, sorry, back one slide, this um, weapon um, is called a katara. And it's basically H-shaped, and you hold it like this, and you can stab someone with it. So it's usually this, it's in your left hand, and you hold your, your talwar in your right hand. So this was Shaista Khan's, and it's now in the Met 
museum. Um, and the idea basically is, well, what, what, what I, I discovered is that writing the novel took me five years. It was two and a half years of research and then two and a half years of writing. So it was, we were talking about it with someone here. It was really pretty much like doing a PhD. Um, and I had never studied um, Bengali history. Um, I grew up in Canada. So for me, it was really an opportunity to go back and learn about a, an era that I was interested in. And I chose this time period because my, uh, my first novel was quite dark, and it was contemporary, and I received a lot of um, feedback from the community that, you know, you're writing in English, why are you portraying Bangladesh in this kind of a light? And I had just finished my master's in social psychology here at LSE, and I had learned about the critical gaze and how you have to look critically at the situation if you want to change it. And I wanted to use writing as a platform for change. And so I had my critical glasses on and I was portraying all of the things that I felt needed change in Bangladesh. But, but people were a little uncomfortable with that. So then I thought, OK, I'm going to look at a time when Bengal was at its peak. And then I discovered in 1685 that Bengal was the cultural and, and, and commercial capital of the entire world. It was the richest place. Almost all exports were coming from Bengal, and everybody was eating. Rice was super cheap, um, and there was music and dance and poetry, and, and we were clothing everybody all over Europe. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to write about 1685. And so that's how Dark Diamond sort of came about. Okay. So, for you history buffs, who are these? Any guesses? No, almost. <laughs> a little bit further back? Uh, a little in between. <laughs> no, Noor Jahan and Jahangir. So, Noor Jahan was Shaista Khan, my protagonist's aunt. His dad was Asaf Khan, who was the vizier to Jahangir. And his, um, his sister was Noor Jahan. So Noor Jahan is Shaista Khan's poopy. OK? All right, next slide. Any guesses? Aurangzeb. That's right. <laughs> this is Aurangzeb reading a Quran Sharif. So for those of you who don't know, basically, um, Akbar was this you know, very syncretic, believed in Islam and Hinduism, and mixed them all together. And you could drink wine or not, and you could sort of find your own space to have the faith you wanted. And then came around a few more generations, and then Aurangzeb, who was very um, narrow-minded. He was very, or, or narrow definition of Islam. He was very orthodox, all about the book. And, um, and the ulema that supported Aurangzeb was also very orthodox. And so this was something that Shaista Khan, who was a Sufi, um, uh, in, in, whose grandfather, was an Iranian who had come and became the vizier. So his grandfather and his father were both viziers. So he has, he has this really great lineage, but he's of the Akbar mentality. And then Aurangzeb comes along, and he's, he's, Shaista Khan was the greatest warlord under the time of Aurangzeb. But Shaista Khan didn't really believe in that kind of orthodox interpretation of Islam. So he had this conflict. What do you do when you're under, you know, when you're emperor, believes in certain values that don't match yours, then do you uphold the values of your emperor in order to be his stalwart supporter? Or do you uphold your own values? And so this conflict is kind of one of the core conflicts I explore in this book. Because Shaisa Khan really sort of sided with Dara Shiko, who was Aurangzeb's brother, who Aurangzeb killed, and killed off that sort of plurality of faith when he brought in um, the more or fundamental sort of orthodox version of Islam. Uh, any guesses who this is? No. No. It's <laughs> paintings. Yeah, these are all paintings. Um, no. This is Shivaji. Dun, dun, dun. So Shivaji was the Maratha chieftain. He was the Hindu um, hero. He was the, a rebel warrior, a guerrilla warrior, who mobilized a lot of Maratha warriors to fight against the Mughal rule, which was predominantly Islamic, and especially when Aurangzeb was in place, very Islamic, because Aurangzeb had started taxing Hindus, and he was not showing the same kind of open-mindedness that his great-great-grandfather had 
established in India. And the interesting thing is, if you read history books, and Mughal history is written mostly in Delhi, by Delhi, or by Britain, um, so the Mughal history is very written from one side, and the Delhi history books love Shivaji. And, um, and if you Google Shaista Khan, you're going to find a, a one paragraph about this, this battle against... Oh, next slide. This battle. Where, Shiva, where Shaista Khan basically overthrew Shivaji and started living in his home, Lal Mahal, which was this palace in um, Pune, just outside of Bombay. Um, but, but Shivaji was very wily, and he kind of figured out, he knew this place inside out because he had grown up, it's his home. He then, um, disguised as a wedding party, entered back in and attacked Shaista Khan in the middle of the night and chopped off three of Shaista Khan's fingers. And it was very like um, the Red Wedding because it was like he, 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 you know, stepping on the hospitality of Shaista Khan. He had gone in at, at pretending it was a wedding. Shaista Khan let him use his garden and then he betrayed him. And um, all of the textbooks that you find on history of this era you know, that's the little bit that you find about Shaista Khan, how he was defeated like a coward by Shivaji. And that got me wondering, because if Bengal was at its peak, it was a commercial and cultural capital of the world, and Shaista Khan in today's terms is a billionaire, and he's a Sufi, and he's a warrior, and he ruled Bengal for 20 years. If all of this happened, why is it that the only thing we see in Wikipedia is that he had three fingers chopped off. So what that made me question is who is writing the historical narrative? And if, if Hindus are writing the historical narrative and nobody is taking side of the Bengal, yeah. and then, you know, obviously, because history is his story, which actually it's really his story because also while researching Shaista Khan, there was nothing about the women, nothing. So it was really hard creating the women characters in this story. And how I made them plausible was found other characters that had, in history, had existed at the same time and then modeled my char women characters around them. But what I think is really important is that, um, you know, living next to India, which is a huge hegemony and kind of influences the thinking and the I ideology of the people in the whole subcontinent, it's very important for Bangladesh and smaller nations around it to have writers who are examining history and recapturing our heroes because otherwise those narratives don't unfold. And also as a woman, a lot of female characters in history, I mean pretty much all the female characters who are powerful have been slut shamed and they're all like, you know, very bad women like Cleopatra was a seductress. And it's just nothing about the fact that she was so powerful and politically wise. It's all you sort of, how do you justify a woman being power? Oh, she must have, you know, slept with Mark Antony. So that's the kind of thing that I think women need to write and subaltern voices need to write. And until we start to do that, it's hard to reclaim um, times when perhaps we were great that have sort of just been brushed under the carpet. Um, so this is a Portuguese ship in Chittagong. Um, and so that my story, I was really excited. I was able to incorporate Portuguese pirates in my story because they were a very big part of Bengal at the time. The Portuguese trade was going on. And Shaista Khan was sent by Aurangzeb to Bengal because at that time the Arakanese were, have, were um, sort of slave trading. And, um, and the Portuguese pirates were in there, and, and, and Mughal, the Mughal Empire was losing control of the Bengal um, Subha, in this province. And so Shaista Khan, being the greatest warlord that he had, and someone very loyal to him, his own uncle, he sent Shaista Khan to overcome them. And Shaista Khan basically took up a whole river, built an entire fleet of boats with his own wealth, which he had already accumulated. He was also a great businessman. And um, went in, befriended the Portuguese, and managed to overthrow the Arakanese in three days, reclaimed Chittagong. But something funny I discovered while writing this book was how history repeats itself. A lot of the enemies that Shaista Khan faced are the same enemies that we face today. Like this area used to be slave trading, and now it is a huge, horrible space of human trafficking. Similarly, Aurangzeb and the Orthodox started re-emerging, and now again we're facing 
you know, we, we've progressed so far in terms of open-mindedness, but yet now we have these fundamentalist pockets jumping up. Um, and then another set of enemies was East India Company that Shaista Khan fought. Um, and East India Company basically wanted to take all of the muslin and cotton without paying due taxes. And again, now we see a, a conversation around how international brands and buyers are buying at dirt cheap rates and local art artisans are living really horrible lives. So it seems like maybe history just keeps repeating itself. Um, this is Lalbagh Fort. Have any of you guys been to Lalbagh Fort in Dhaka? Yeah. Okay. So um, my daddy's house is right next to it. So this is how I came to know about Shaista Khan and then decided to start researching. This is a painting by Charles O'Doyley made about 100 years after Shaista Khan's time. But that fortress is still there. This is a map done by um, the East India Company of Bengal. And it's the rich kingdom of Bengal. So, you know... How dreamy can we imagine that today? But maybe cyclical, you know, as time is. Who knows? Um, so another aspect that I wanted to explore for myself was Sufism, which I think is a very beautiful a way of practicing Islam. And, and this is an ancient painting, a Sufi painting, and cats. So cats were really sort of intertwined in a lot of the stories around jinns. And, and, and jinns and cats and these things that people now call sort of superstition actually are very much a part of our religious texts. And, um, you know, how much of it is fantasy and how much of it might be real, I ask you to question. Um, who knows who this is? Yes, this is Kali. Uh, so in my story, I've got both Islamic and Hindu, um, you know, myths and stories and legends, because at the time they were both very much alive in Bengal. And, and I, Kali is amazing, a very powerful feminine deity. Um, so, so she's in the story. Who knows who this is? This is a famous traveler. No, French traveler. And this is Jean-Paul Jean Baptiste. Uh, no, Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. Um, and he discovered this diamond called the French Blue um, in Golconda. So in my story, there is also a diamond from Golconda. So, you know, if you're wondering, could it, it's so unrealistic. How could there be a diamond from Golconda that there's so much fighting about? Well, actually, there, there was such a diamond, and it's recorded. And next slide. That diamond was bought by, does anybody know who this is? Huh? Yeah. King Louis. Yeah. So King Louis is a character in my novel a little bit because he also was in the same era. And, um, and France and Europe were loving the diamonds coming out of India at the time. And India was the only source of diamonds at the time. Um, and William Dalrymple has recently written a book about Kohinoor, which is the twin sister of Kalinoor, the cursed diamond that features in my story. This is Madame Maintenon, who was um, King Louis' mistress and later wife. Um, and there was a big scandal around fake pearls that had been purchased for her. King Louis hadn't known they were fake, and then it turned out they were fake. So this is a bit of history I've threaded into my story. So basically, my story is made up of snippets of history that I've found and then woven into the narrative. And the narrative is fiction, but a lot of the plot points are actual facts from history. This is a Portuguese pirate. <laughs> um, um, so in my movie, he's going to be played by Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> um, this is a Portuguese cock. And um, this also features in my story. So if you, when you read it and you're wondering what they look like, this is what they look like. This is another Mughal painting. This is a, a, a woman with an eagle or falcon. Sorry, falcon. So falconeering was very popular at the time. And, you know, they were very beautiful, they were, you know, very ornamental, had this incredible jewelry, um, very sheer muslin clothing, appearances were very important at the time. The Mughal lifestyle was sort of just, you know, you can imagine 
very upper class and extravagant, and、um, that was something that I thought was really amazing. And I think at some point I would love to make this into like a West End Broadway production because I think just the costumes would just be so delightful. <coughs> this weapon. Is there any weapon aficionados in here? Elan, do you know what this is? It's a sword. It's a sword. It's called a thalwar. So. Thalwar, Shaisa Khan fights with a Thalwar. He was a great warrior. And and do you know what this is? It's like a dagger. It's called a scorpion dagger. It's a bichwa, and you would stick it in, and then you would twist. <laughs> and this one? It's a hammerhead. Exactly, it's a hammerhead dagger. And this is my handsome Shaisa Khan. Um, well, you can see with the katara right there, the pool katara,、um, and he was obviously very handsome. <laughs> okay, this was my so that's Dark Diamond. This is the second book I wrote. It's called Intentional Smile.、Um, the re- one of the reasons I wanted to write Dark Diamond was because I found that the history of Bangladesh, kind of pretty much all the books that are available. Focus on 1971, and I wanted to dig deeper and remind the youth that we have this huge ancient history that is so much richer that we're almost never studying. And all the textbooks are really dry. And Shaisa Khan has just those three paragraphs where he loses his fingers. Now, intentional smile I wrote because、um, I've kind of had to deal with depression in my life, and my one of my best friends dealt with chronic pain, and these are things that are sort of really taboo in Bangladesh. Nobody really talks about mental health issues, and、um, and as a yoga teacher, this is something that I've sort of journeyed into a lot. And we just kind of wanted to share a little bit some of the techniques that we had picked up about how to stay positive and explored. And Meryl, you know, with chronic pain, had gone through all sorts of. Western science. She's from Wisconsin,、um, and then she just started discovering some Eastern healing techniques, and they really helped. And it's funny how things like yoga were were looked down upon for many years after col- colonization, and, and the British came in, and they were all about science, and, and local traditions were sort of inferiorized. And now they've been appropriated by America and England, and now yoga has become really hot. And now again, we're turning back to those traditions, but we've lost them almost in Bangladesh,、um, and in, in India is now sort of regaining it. And、um, and I, I kind of just wanted to open people's eyes to the various ways of healing, and and so this is sort of it's an illustrated taster to some of the techniques that we've learned. This is this is the idea is about loving yourself and cheerleading and how if you want to love anybody you have to start with loving yourself because until you love yourself you don't have that extra love to give so everybody try this go like this and be like oh yeah you are great everybody be like I love me Elan do it I love me ah. So I love me technique is something anybody here who wants to try it. If you try it for twenty days, I swear to God, you are going to feel like a totally different person at the end of the twenty days. You do it first thing in the morning. I did it for twenty days, and what happens is instead of waking up and being like, "Oh, another day," and where's my coffee, and who's going to love me today? You wake up and you're like, "I love me. I am so awesome." And then everybody you meet, you're like, "I love you too," and you're just your cup overfloweth. So. It was one of the techniques that I think really helps and adds a, a tactile dimension to self affirmations. This is the monkey mind,、um, and basically meditation helps create space so that you can take yourself away from the obsessive thoughts that we're all stuck in.、Um, so we talk about that. So this girl is basically in that red car, and we sit in traffic a lot in Bangladesh.、Um, But the idea is, it doesn't matter where you are physically, mentally, you can be anywhere, and you can be you know, live every day like a vacation. And so that was, and it's illustrated by Lara, who's a Bangladeshi, but she's worked for for folks like Disney, and she's super incredible. You will love her art. I mean, it's a it's not available here, but it's available on Amazon if anyone's interested. One slide. This is my first book, Like a Diamond in the Sky. Um. It's contemporary about Dhaka City today, sex, drugs, and rock and roll.、Um, it's the story of a heroin junkie who is、um, sort of 
alienated and disillusioned and very upset about the poverty and the politics. And he, he's trying to find a way to connect, but he can't find anything to connect to. And his name is Dean. Um, and it's kind of uh, based on, from you know, the beatniks. So various different communities of literary writers have written about drugs in different eras and different parts of the world. And the beatniks were one of them. And I love beatniks. And Jack Kerouac is one of my favorite writers. And in On the Road, his main character is Dean Moriarty. So Dean from Dean. But also Dean is the word Dean. And Dean Dunya basically means Dean is the spiritual and Dunya is the material. And it's the struggle between the spiritual and the material. And so Dean is looking for a spiritual connection. But in order to achieve it, he keeps going to drugs, which is ironically bringing him back to the material world. And he just can't find that way out. So that's the story I explore here. Um, this is a, a Bosti, a slum. And um, I did my research here at LS, uh, for my master's at LSE on happiness among the extreme poor. So I spent um, a, you know, a few months interviewing women living in slums who were extremely poor. And that research fed into one of my characters, Falani, who is the single mom slum dweller that sells drugs to the rich boys. Um, and she's stuck in this heroin loop herself because that's the way she's earning her living. Um, and yeah, so those are, that's it. So um, yeah, I, I, I could take some questions or. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of us to Ms. Sergio Amor for a wonderful explanation about her writing and her, uh, about the book, Did God Diamond, and including other two books she wrote already. So uh, may I request now the author to read some of the parts of her own book so we could hear some more from, more from her own voice. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I wanted to say, so the reason I wrote like, like a Diamond in the Sky, I had just moved to Bangladesh, and I found that heroin was a big problem there. And yet, again, another topic of taboo where people weren't talking about addiction, weren't seeing addiction as a state of negative, low self-esteem, where, where we're criminalizing it, and families and parents whose children were addicts felt they couldn't talk about it. That's why I wanted to write something that would make it okay to talk about Thank you. Okay. Um, so the, the rise of fundamentalism in Bangladesh is extremely disturbing. And especially you probably know in the last three years, 40 writers have been hacked to death like with machetes. So this, is, this was a hard thing for me to write about because it's doesn't feel so safe. But I feel like if we don't write about it and if we don't ask questions, um, then, I don't know, then what's the point? Okay, so chapter 29. <clears throat> At the Diwani Am the next day, a group of Sunni mullahs arrived as per the summons. Bhopal led them to the stand. Alim al-Ali, cleric commander, bowed first. Who are you to pass provincial policy? Asked Shaista. Beads of sweat collected on his forehead. He ran his fingers through his uncut beard and stuttered, Your Highness, other provinces in the empire are passing the same laws with the emperor's approval. I will never pass a law that prohibits girls from schools. Shaista could not believe the ulema's gall. Was this yet another outcome of the diamond's curse? Or did they truly believe the solution to their disillusioned state lay in the exclusion of women. Women are like tamarinds, a mullah piped in. He was young, his beard not fully formed yet. When we see them, we are tempted to suck. If they roam among us, can you blame us for desiring them? Henceforth, rape shall be punishable by castration, said Shaista. The man balked. Allah has forbidden books by non-Muhammadans, said another mullah. Only the Quran should be taught in schools, and only the ulema are qualified to teach it. Shaista frowned. The density of your ignorance has obscured your view. Allah cannot be known through authoritarian dogma. To find Allah, one must journey into the question, who am I? We know who we are. We are God-fearing men, said Alim. We follow the rules in the Quran. Music is haram. No more kawalis. Music is the highest form of worship, 
said Shaista. Though this was not the sort of sapient throng to appreciate esoteric lessons on Sufi secrets. I pray that Allah showers you with wisdom to clear your misconceptions. Emperor Aurangzeb has disbanded the Mughal atelier in Delhi and the artists have come to you in search of patronage, said Alim. We advise you not to give them employment in your court. Your understanding of theology is weak, said Subedar Khan, wondering how they knew this already. Your spiritual paucity is appalling. What about jizya, said Alim. Aurangzeb has reinstated the tax for Hindus. There was no end to their intolerance. Their abhorrent desire to create division enraged Shaista. Bengal is a secular, liberal, and enlightened social sphere. If I hear of any further complaint against women, children, teachers, Hindus, musicians, dancers, or artists, there will be severe consequences. His voice hovered above a lethal whisper. This is your final warning. What little confidence the mullahs had left dissipated. They dispersed in a hurry, tripping over each other on the way. Bhopal lingered by the plinth. Don't worry, sire. I have an idea. Shall I send them to the gallows? said Shaista. No, 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 no. Behead them? No. Musket fire? No. The plank? offered Shaista. Feed them to the crocodiles? No, said Bhopal. Why not buy the ulama's support? For all their talk of spirituality, they're really after your wealth. With a few lakhs, you could build them a mosque like the seven-domed one you built the others. Give it eight domes. Bhopal, I am ashamed of you. Would you really have me buy their loyalty? That would only empower them. Radical beliefs will destabilize Bengal if not rooted out. This must be part of the curse. The curse? Don't worry, Popal. I will handle it, reassured Shaista. Be careful, warned Popal. The emperor arrives in a few weeks. He has ordered the ulema to be respected. We mustn't anger him. Shaista chafed at the advice. Now his chief revenue officer sounded like his wife. With the Noraz fast approaching, there were bigger things to worry about than his nephew. Kali Noor was out to destroy Bengal. He had to be ready. He completed the public session, then retired to his chamber to oil his sword. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> What a wonderful way to read your own book. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. <laughs> thank you. Really mesmerizing in terms of uh, hearing the book. Uh, we hope we all will read this book and get to learn something about the history of Bengal in 1685 and onwards and afterwards. So we are here uh, now to open to the questions. If anyone has any questions, uh, can put to directly to the author, please. Yes. First of all, thank you. It was absolutely wonderful Aww. all of you sharing. I mean, everything about all the books you work is absolutely, you know, I salute you. Thank you. Um, two questions. One, could you please elaborate on what you mentioned about your diamond being the twin diamond of the Koh-i-Noor. I mean, is that, is that like physically the twin or sort of like mythically the twin? And also, I don't know if you're going to be in London on the 23rd of this month, but um, one of the um, great feminists before the term feminism was, was coined was Rubinton's Tagore. And there's going to be a Tagore opera about um, a, a, a Chitran Gada, I think. Ah. Yes, thank you. Good. Thank you so much. There's going to be a performance, so everyone here is welcome and um, free tickets. And um, if you just speak to me afterwards, and um, I'd be delighted if you would come as an honoured guest. I'm assisting the organiser, Dr. Ananda Gupta. And whereas the story comes from the Mahabharata, where she is um, a princess who's very passive, um, she's very beautiful, very feminine, very passive. Tagore, because he was a feminist before the term was coined. He recreates her as a not very beautiful princess, um, and she is very much an empowered woman, and Arjuna needs to learn to love her for herself. Lovely. So the music is glorious, the costumes are glorious, oh. the dancing is glorious. If, if by 
any chance. I'm not come. here, but I would definitely come it's if I was. It's a Tandalika. Tandalika. Oh, that sounds brilliant. Yes, yes. But I mean, to go to is absolutely superb. Mm. I mean, to and I've never been a, to one. They're a revelation. And so Dr. Ananda Gupta, I mean, this is the third one he's done in London. He did one um, in Orbean about spring. And it was absolutely delight oh. just a few weeks back. And I'm hoping he's got more plans. And is it in English? No, it's in Bengali. Oh, OK. But I'm going to try to persuade him to have um, narration in English. Uh -huh. And I'm going to suggest that I do a write-up that can be read beforehand oh, that, so people uh, understand can follow the, the story. plot. Right. Oh, that sounds yeah. great. Well, I'll definitely swap contacts with you so that well, next time I'm in London, I'll plan it so I can be here for yeah, that. Yeah, I'll keep in touch with you. But yeah, yeah, I would love to. Months. There's a book by Chitra Banerjee Devakurni um, called Palace of Illusions that I just read, which is um, Draupadi's perspective of Mahabharata. Yeah. And it's beautifully written. And because Mahabharata, you know, it's the five brothers marry this one woman. And the story always comes from the male perspective. But what would it be like to be the woman married to Bhimsa uh, and Arjun and, you know, all the five brothers? So it's, re it's really interesting. I mean, this, this was actually, he, he, re he sort of revamped his book, Chitra. He, he, he gave the play Chitra to, I think it was about the 1890s. Um, he published the Chitra, which he didn't feel that the public could pronounce correctly. Uh, <laughs> the uh. reason uh, the, the sort of English-speaking public. And so, in 1936, when um, he was struggling financially with um, Shantini Kakan to fund it, he was getting too old to go on the tours. He was in his mid 70s. So, um, because it's the sort of education that the British did not want, uh. I mean, they wanted, you know, nice, obedient Indians yeah. who would fit the purposes of the imperial machine. So education that would have people free spirits, free thinking, communing with nature was not what they were going to condone or, or endorse. Right. So he was struggling financially, no longer able to go on these international tours to fundraise. So that's why he decided to go on the fundraising tour with this. Oh. He, re he recreated as a dance drama and then Calcutta and Delhi and a series of other places. Wow. So it's, it's sort of interesting the, the context that it occurred in. Wow, yeah. what a brilliant, brilliant guy. <laughs> I know, I know. Awesome. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Yep. Yes, please. Well, let me just say the Kalinur Kohinoor thing for a sec. So, Kohinoor is the mountain of light, it's the white diamond, and Kalinoor, the twin sister. Twin in a mythical sort of way, because, but born of Golconda mines. So from the same birthplace, but the, but she's the, the black diamond. But all these big diamonds, the French blue, the Kohinoor, the Hope diamond, they've all got these crazy histories. Everybody who has owned them has um, had great danger befall them. And so that's why Koh Kalinoor also, whoever owns, you know, is going to face terrible, terrible. Men. <laughs> the men. <laughs> right. No, I'm just going to grab a tissue. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I think you've kind of gone through quite a journey from the first book, the second book, now all of a sudden, uh, historical oh, God, thank you. Uh, fiction. Um, how have you found that journey? I mean, is it just by accident? Were you planning it? Were you kind of working a different, um, your own journey yourself? What was it that kind of thing to choose? Hi, Deepa <laughs> Um I guess I've always wanted to be a writer. And my first book sort of came up because of, partially because of my research on happiness among the ultra poor and partially, thank you, aww. Partially because of what I saw as the current problem that I wanted to deal with. And then the second book was, again, the issues in my life and the community around me that I felt needed to be addressed. And then the third book sort of, again, stemmed from the same thing, wanting, wanting to address some of the contemporary enemies without going head on um, by looking at who were the ones that we were fighting in history and drawing the parallels. And I think anybody who reads the book now will be able to see that it's not, I'm not just commenting on the Ulema of 1685, but also of the current situation and what we're trying to fight now in Bangladesh. Um, and so, 
I guess the journey has sort of just, in, you know, and growing as a writer also has been from, I've been living in Bangladesh the last 10 years. <laughs> And so that's really also informed what are the topics I'm writing about. If I were in Canada, I probably would have been writing something completely different. I grew up in Canada. Um, but being in Bangladesh is an opportunity for me because there aren't that many other writers. And so sort of any topic that's of interest probably hasn't been touched upon so much. And that's really a luxury I've got right now. And um, I think I've you know, learned a lot by having been writing for so many years. And I you know there's some writers in the audience. One of the things that really helped me on my journey as a writer is we had, I've always had a writing group. So first it was writer's block and we were together for seven years and we would meet every Saturday. And then eventually everyone got a book out and the, after seven years it sort of fizzled. And then now it's another one called Pen Warriors. And it's the same thing. Because I find if you don't share your work and if you don't have... Um, deadlines, it becomes very difficult to progress, <laughs> especially when you have a day job and children and things like that. Deadlines are really important. And feedback. And it's nice to get feedback sooner because if it's a five-year project, if you're not getting any feedback along the way, you can lose steam. It's easy to lose steam. <laughs> what, what kept you going all those five years? Because as you said, steam runs out at some point. Well, the writing group. In a big way, the writing group. Their support and their deadlines. So you must have been really passionate about that character. Oh, I love Shai Sakan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it because he's a symbolic, uh, symbol of Bengal? Well, he's a Sufi warlord billionaire. I mean, need I say more? And a woman. And a modern troll as well. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, People flourished under I mean, you him. Said there's less woman characters, but you, your attention drew to this male character. Both my novels had male protagonists. Mm. Part of the reason is because every time I start writing females, I start like confessing all my dark secrets. <laughs> and so I didn't want to do that. <laughs> writing about a male gives me enough yeah. space <laughs> from the character. Although I think the next one, I think it's time. <laughs> I need to go to my female side. So how did you do this one? How did you do all that? Where when you're writing as, a, as a writer, as an author, um, and you, how do you block that side out where you think, oh no, my audience might think that it's, I'm writing about myself, my, 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 my life, my secret, whatever. I mean, everyone thinks I am anyway. Like, about the heroin junkie, everyone's like, oh yeah. <laughs> so I think that's something you can't avoid. Right. But really, I don't care if they think that, you know, that I'm a mogul warlord or heroin junkie, that's all right. <laughs> Uh, that I am. <laughs> this one's non-fiction, intentional smiles. So it's a bit separate. Yes. Uh, my name is Zaki, and I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, uh, for your books, why did you focus on Bangladeshi history? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, I f focused on Bangladeshi history because I feel like nobody has focused on it. And I want Bangladeshis to know their past, and I want them to know their past before 1971. Um, and I wasn't alive in 1971. Maybe if I was, it would be hard for me to go to any other conflict because it was such a painful space for people. But since I wasn't, I think I had the freedom to pick a time, any time in the history of Bengal, and there's a lot of other really interesting times. Like, we were a flourishing Buddhist community. Where has that gone? So I think we need to look at our past to remember the plurality that existed. What I mean is, like, a lot of different types of people have lived in that little space. And I don't want us to forget it. So that's why. And I wanted to learn about it also. So. <laughs> Are you writing any more books? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Like, um, you're not saying star, you can say, you know, I'm saying shy star. Shy star. What I want to say is that um, my partner uh, has a, I don't know, she never says it, but she has this, she has this thing for diamond, and maybe the culture and history or some kind of connection that diamonds have in Bangladesh or that region. Do you know what it might be? She has a disdain. Disdain, yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's a funny thing, right? It's complete, the value is completely man-made. Um, and there's no intrinsic value to the thing. I mean, well, it is the hardest substance in the world. Sure, there's that. But the fact that we would spend so much money, you know, give up lives for the sake of obtaining diamonds, whereas it's, it's just man-made, the value, that kind of, it worries me. Why do we put so much value on things like, you know, on a, like a diamond over lives? So that was one thing. Um, and then the diamond trade has had a significant impact on that region. That's another thing. So for various reasons, I've um, looked at it. But maybe your partner, you know, maybe she's not so capitalistic and superficial. So, I mean, hats off to her. Maybe she'd prefer a wildflower. <laughs> I don't know a red diamond. I know the pink diamond. There's a pink diamond, the Darya Noor, that's uh, apparently with the Iranian princess. Some, some sources say it's in Shonali Bank in Bangladesh. I've not, I haven't come across a red diamond. Please, 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 and only in one month, just by watching the London documentary, right. I could get really into the subject. Right. Now, bringing up children in Bangladesh, um, there's different types of education, they're all a bit split split, there's English and English. Right. Uh, Bangla medium and Madrasas and stuff. I mean, what are people being taught? What can they do if they want to read for themselves? Well, that's a really good question. And that comes back to the, the idea of who's writing the narrative. One of the reasons I wanted to write about Shaisa Khan is I wanted a brown Indiana Jones because there are no brown heroes. They're all white. So even in history books in Bangladesh, well, Bangladesh's history books, Bangladesh studies is now an O-level subject, which is great because it wasn't before. But it's so dry. There's no exciting, even if you're learning Bangla, my kids have these, you know, the books that they read. They're, they're, written by adults for adults. There's like one illustration every five pages. There's no exciting plot line. There's no magic. So I think if we really want us to be proud of our heritage, we need to do it justice in terms of art and entertainment and these documentaries. But I think also um, to invest in culture requires a certain kind of, first of all, wealth, and second of all, um, open-mindedness. Um, and so I hope that's something that we embrace because otherwise we're sort of just whittling away what we've already had for so many years and losing it. Um, so, yeah, we need to have some good stories and good documentaries. Thank you. Is it? All right. Any filmmakers here? <laughs> Any funders? <laughs> okay. Now, thank you very much. Um, actually, in a sense, you are very much right. Um, you know, the character of Christ um, it was not that much exposed in Bangladeshi general history. Um, uh, that's why, especially you say about, you know, the ideological con contradiction between Shaista Khan and fundamentalist um, Aurangzeb is a really, really nice point. Even, um, we don't know, we didn't know before. I was, a, I, I was not a history student, but I was very, very fond of history, uh, all, all, all kind of history, actually. So this is nice. It's good, very good. Yeah. Mm, it will be uh, very good to us uh, to know mm, about whole real history. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yep, yeah, um, going slightly further on what this gentleman was saying about how heritage is being lost in, in those countries, India, and uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Africa, and other continents. But do you feel that's because of the lack of knowledge, or is it just because the way the power of control is happening in those countries that's preventing people from speaking out? Like for yourself, do you think it would have been different for you had you been born and stayed and lived and learned and educated yourself in Bangladesh? Do you think you would have had the same amount of freedom to write these books, or is it because you've been to Canada, you've had a different kind of experience, and you're coming back to, to your own kind of roots? I mean, how, how is that? 
Yeah, I think there's definitely something there. When you return to a place, you have a different sort of way of looking at it and exploring it, and you're not already fettered or shuttered by um, the paradigms that that community is sort of growing up in. Definitely, I think that had a big thing to do with it, and especially things like you know yoga. Before I moved to Bangladesh, there were no yoga teachers in Dhaka, and now there are many, but. I, coming from the West, it was something I brought back to Bangladesh. It's quite early because yoga originated from India. Exactly. Just next door. Oh, we, part, we, we, are, we were India. Yes. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's our heritage and I think we should reclaim it. But, um, but it took someone from the West to move back there to bring it back there. Now it's thriving and a lot of my students are also teachers and there's lots of people doing yoga. But just as an example, I definitely think having lived abroad and returned to Bangladesh gave me the ability to look at and write about it in a different way. Also, there's a lot of people writing in Bangla. Um, so uh, as an English writing you know, person in Bangladesh, I'm able to bring the stories out to the West. But those Bangladesh writers that aren't, they need to be translated so their stories can also come abroad. We need to have more of that as well. Sixty-six, right? Sixty-six. Um, do you think you know the the hatred against the Rohingyas has something to do with um, you know that tragedy right. of the Arakan? Because right. there's a lot of that defeat. Uh, even the Arakan lost its own independence of and were gobbled up by Burma. Right. 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 Um, and also the Arakan and the Portuguese took a lot of Bengali slaves. Right. As slaves. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because these are all man-made borders and then you're dispelling people from their native homes. So that's the one area where Shaista Khan wasn't so much of a hero. Um, that, yeah, but, but at the same time, I, I mean, I think that was part of the problem. The Arakanese being kicked out and the tolerance for Buddhism that was sort of stomped out by the Mughal Empire. And now we need to readdress that. And, and otherwise, we are moving towards a very homogenous kind of space in Bangladesh where there isn't um, an opportunity to express other faiths. And that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, in that sense, Shaista Khan did what the enemies are doing. I mean, was a bad guy. But uh, yeah, definitely. I think that was one of the times when the problem of that region began for the people of Arakan. Did you, uh, I read your stuff, did you give any uh, background context of Aurangzeb's brother who was murdered in Arakan? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Shuja. Shah Shuja. Shuja. I did. It's very interesting. Um, when you read about history, you hear about Shah, Shah Shuja and this, this jewel that he had that the Arak he, he took refuge in, in Chittagong because Aurangzeb was out to kill him. But when he got to Chittagong, they killed him. And the history books say it's because of a jewel. But as I started to research more, it, it, it appears that the jewel might have been his daughter. And that is something that I've recaptured in my story and that I think is just so moving and touching that his most precious jewel, and you, you read about it as a jewel, but actually it's, it's, a, it's a living human being. He's, uh Right, right. And he got uh, assistance from the Portuguese to help him. And the Portuguese deliberately sunk one of the boats mm -hmm. carrying, you know, the lot of the jewels. So they took one anyway before he got there. And then when um, Hasus got to um, Rao, we have to work, and he too, he kind of disappeared, all his money. And at that time, the Dutch were sending um, 
in other things, I am into Murao, Tarakan, to buy Bengal jewelry, jewels and diamonds and everything that were being sold on the tip in the black market. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, I know it's the later on, the family, everybody were murdered. Right. Is this something that's in your book? No, no, no. This East India Company book over there. I should, let's talk about that a little bit. Could you introduce that to the audience? Where's that? I don't have a copy here. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm, I'm so glad you guys have touched on this part of history also, and I'm really excited to read this book. Well done. Thanks, uh, thanks for the comment. Uh, should we get a question from Clara, please? Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you also write in the Bengal history, mm -hmm. the um, I don't write in Bengali because I can't. <laughs> um, yeah, writing in English is hard enough. <laughs> also, all 40 of the bloggers who were killed were writing in Bengali. So right now is not a very good time to be writing in Bengali. One of the things I really uh, look forward to reading is the fact that the chapters are quite short. <laughs> one of the things that puts me off from reading any book, uh, any novel, is that it takes forever to get to the end. Right. So I think uh, this would be a good read, definitely. And uh, I, I, I work as a, my newfound uh, is, uh, is, is motivational public speaking. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think that book, uh, you know, for children, is really interesting. I'd love to get my hands on it. Uh, but I, I really want to, in that in that uh, context, I just want to say that uh, you know, within every one of us, there is there is a dream that we're all uh, trying to live. And if you put your commitment to it, uh, then eventually you can live that dream. And writing books and publishing or singing or, or writing a play, whatever it may be. Each one of us are capable of some miracle, some magic that will touch other people's lives. So don't let your dream drift away. Um, you know, and I want to congratulate you for 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 you know for accomplishing this task because I know they can be very painful and it can be at times very testing. But the fact that you carried on and you know, you're on your third book, well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. point about um, the distance um, being helpful, um, having got away from Bangladesh and going back, it just brought to mind, um, I speak as an Irishman whose family um, lived for generations in Calcutta, um, it brought to mind the name of some um, Irish writers who really benefited from getting away from Ireland and getting a whole new perspective. So, they include James Joyce, um, George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde and Samuel Beckett. Oh, lovely. Each of them for various periods of their life were away. And it really sort of enhanced their perspective on how they were able to look on Ireland and write about Ireland. And also Graham Greene, the English writer, travelled extensively. And again, that changed his whole perspective about the English and about you know, the insidious nature of empire. So, so I just sort of thought that mm. that's what came to mind when there was a discussion about you and the distance you gained. Right. To be able to, to look afresh at Bangladesh. Absolutely. Mm. Super. I'll bid you for it. I'll tell you what, if you let me take the picture, I'll let you go first. I wanted to touch on what you said there, because did, did, did you find, I mean, um, being away from Bangladesh, living um, as a diaspora in Canada, and then coming back, has it been about the question of your own identity? Mm. Um, because when I did my PhD, and you know, when I wrote about, when I've written plays about my culture, it came at a time where I I questioned what is my cultural identity, and, mm. and you know, how can I claim this culture if I don't know the history of it, and if yeah. I don't know what um, you know what legacy that culture has left for me to carry? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like if you think you're, you know, if you're an expert at something, you, you, you know, if you're going to choose to do a, an art form, for example, 
my philosophy is then you need to know everything about it. Absolutely. So that, so that you are, you know, you're an expert at it. Right. Um, did, you, did you think about that as your own self-identification process in writing well, and um, it was intimidating to write about Mughal history when I'm not a his history major. And people who, have like I met this lady named um, Rosie Levelin, who is um, Her Majesty's something or other, like has been knighted basically. And she wrote about Lahore. Um, and she's been studying the topic for 20 years. And I had to be in a panel with her. And she you know, proofread my book. And it's intimidating to write about a period. And you're not sure if you are the authority on that period, which is why I did so much research and I really worked my, you know, yeah, yeah. worked like a dog to put it together. So at, by the time it was out, I was confident that I knew more than anybody else who was reading about it about that period. Yeah. Um, and I also shared it with, you know, the professor of history in Dhaka University, with William Dalrymple, with Rosie Llewellyn, and got everyone's feedback to make sure I wasn't making any huge mistakes that would, mm. you know, um, and same with Like a Diamond in the Sky, I, I, I really knew my material super well. But that is, it, that is a hard space. To, uh, not, not the cultural identity so much, but the, the topic, the knowledge you need for the topic you're writing about, which, which I think when you're doing creative writing, a lot of people don't realize is it's so much research. Even if it's just completely fictional, not historical fiction, it's still so much research because you have to be the authority on that, on that topic by the time you're done with the book. Where do you place yourself in that research and that history? Have you do do that? I think of myself as? Yeah, how, where, where do you? I mean, do you do you think of yourself? With, you know. You know, I I I struggled with fitting in when I was in Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really struggled with fitting in. I wasn't allowed to do the same things that my friends were allowed to do. I wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend. You know. mm -hmm. um, so that so I I felt like an outsider in a lot of ways. Then I moved to Bangladesh, and you know I had an American accent, and I wanted to do yoga and write, and then again I felt like an outsider. So I've always felt like the fringe. I've never felt like I really fit in. But now it's come to a point where I'm like, well, you know, the fringe is pretty cool. <laughs> so it's okay if you don't aren't the convention and you're not conforming. And in fact, now I've come to hate conformity. So I don't know. It's, it's become very confusing. <laughs> Fear of, of censoring, uh, or the fear of not being able to write, is something that personally I, I, I don't I don't like to be told what to write. Yeah? I mean, and I'm not afraid to use profanity to tell somebody either. Um, but what I do have to say is, uh, you as a female Bangladeshi in Bangladesh, writing the stuff that you're writing, uh, regardless of whether you inflame people uh, or not, I, I really really do. Um, I respect you for that. Mm. Thank it you. Takes, listen, man, I'm, I, I write some really highly <laughs> topical stuff, yeah, and I get a lot of backlash from the community. How dare you say this? And that's just here. That's just in England. That's right. just the UK. Right. Right? I've written about drug addiction. I've written about gambling addiction and prostitution and the rest of it. And the communities, they're like, no, 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 that doesn't exist. Now. Actually, it does, because right. I was there. Right. Um, so, and, and, and that's just me in my little world, with the amount of backlash. You, you're, you're a female in Bangladesh. Uh, with a bunch of mad mullahs. And, um, <laughs> and then, no, no, like you said, the happy right. people to death. But the fact that you continue doing what you do, yeah, from every writer, I can genuinely say uh, kudos to you. Thank you. Um, rather you than me. I mean, I think the biggest censor is really not the public, but your family or your in laws. You know, you, you oh, kind no, of have no, to no, worry no, about no, your in laws. No, no, no. That, that, that I don't care about. Okay, yeah. well. But my in-laws are super supportive, so but that's been all right. You, and, and like I said, I, I, I think you, you hold the flag up for writers all over the world, mm. uh, and regardless of the danger. You, you say, you're saying, you're making that statement, I will continue writing. I'm not, you know, I know it's scary, but you're doing, you're doing a very good thing. Thank you. Know, you. Keep it up. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we'll take a question from you. Uh, would it be possible for you to give a brief history of Arab influence in uh, Bangladesh and the Indian subcontinent as well as what? Uh, 
um, any remaining Arab uh, influences today and how it affected uh, your story? Nice question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'll just... Geopolitically, there is so much funding behind one particular brand of Islam that other expressions of the faith are really just being stomped out. And there's something wrong with that. But, I don't know, capitalism seems to be really popular and, and um, oil and weapons and money are so powerful that until we can embrace something that's m more human, I think we're going to continue to face the kind of problems that we're facing today. And I think the beauty of Islam is getting sort of smudged out by all of the hatred being created around this one version that is really upheld by geopolitical powers, nothing else. Um, and that is affecting everything in the world. Um, and that's maybe the influence that, I mean, Mughals were also super wealthy and powerful and that was their stamp. And, but, th but that was different. They still, at least they still appreciated culture and art and, and it was a, at Akbar's time it was pluralistic. But we saw the problems begin when Aurangzeb started narrowing it. And in really building walls and narrowing expression is just the wrong way to go. I don't know how everybody doesn't see that, but money is funneling a certain point of view and I hope that people start to question that. Not only at Bostam, I think Aurangzeb's own father built the Taj Mahal, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not just a religious thing where... Um, but, uh, not religion, money. Money, money. Money and influence. Politics. Yes, I think. Hi, uh, congratulations on the book. Um, uh, my question was, how do you deal with reviews, uh, negative reviews? Every time I ask you... Yeah. There was a fairly uh, critical review of the book uh, I came across this morning, actually, in Dhaka paper. Uh, Did it come out today? I don't know if it came out. I think it's part of the Arts and Letters supplement. Right. Uh, I mean, I've had some amazing reviews, so I'm really, really grateful to them. Um, have you read it? But this bad one, I just heard about. I haven't read it yet. Okay, but so, so, I mean, uh, uh, I thought that it was unnecessary and harsh influence, but they did make a couple of good points in terms of historical accuracy, for example, the presence of potatoes in Bengal in the 11th century when it really was <laughs> coming out of America, the American Lots continent Lots until Lots. the 15th century. So basic things like that. So uh, how, how, do you deal, how do you deal with that, you know, like the whole process of, you know, reviews and responding to them and all that? Um, in general, my opinion about reviewing books or art or anything is, you know, support the arts, support the literature, encourage reading, encourage writing. If people want to be critical, it's easy to be critical. Of course, there's a thousand problems in that book. I'm not Tagore. But, you know, I've gone out there and tried to write about a time that no one's written about, and I've said my piece, and I've spoken against things that are very powerful right now. People will criticize it. If they didn't criticize it, it probably means they, I mean, if they criticize it, I would question where are they coming from? You know, why did this other young Bangladeshi writer want to pick on, you know, potatoes? Like, did he find nothing else to talk about in the book? But I, I don't know. D different people have different ways of looking at things. I think there's a different aspect of uh, seeing a book, the critics. I think uh, people did criticize uh, Tagore after he said, mentioned it. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, if Tagore got criticism, then hey, why not me? <laughs> you get the, um, it, it is horrible getting reviews um, from peers as well um, on your writing because they're, my supervisor advised me once, read it, the review that is, read it, then put it away and let it go for a bit and then revisit it. Because it is, it is always personal. It feels personal, like a personal attack on your work. Right. And you know, especially when you put so much blood, sweat, and tears right. into something, and then someone's being critical. <laughs> but it's okay because we. You know, are there's, maybe people. there's something to learn from exactly. it. Also, mm -hmm. I didn't know there weren't yeah, potatoes there. I've read two pieces in that book. 
two short, short stories. Um, I'm not a writer here, just a short story. Um, and firstly, my own closest friend, who I thought would be really supportive. <laughs> and uh, bless him, but he's really he's, he's good, he's a nice guy. But first, we picked up all the mistakes that are in there. Uh, oh, right. God. After it was published or before? Yeah, exactly. Sorry? After it was published oh, or? Oh. <laughs> but, then, um, but that's what you learn from. You, you learn, learn from, from it, stuff, exactly. So that's true. Mistakes, you know. Right. right. But I, I like the idea of, you know, criticize in private, you know, sup encourage in public, mm -hmm. but... Yeah. <laughs> Long question in short. So if you find a mistake in terms of historical concept in your book and somebody pointed out, will you correct it at your next edition? Um, I don't know if there's going to be another next edition. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had the opportunity to go to a bunch of lit fests, and in the Jaipur lit fest, I had people like, Booker Prize winners telling me, um, like Alan Hollinghurst, I don't know if you've read his book, In the Line of Beauty, beautiful book, and he was saying how when he had written a historical piece, somebody called him up just to tell him that this one word you used didn't exist in that time. And you, you know, it happens. It's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, about to end the for today's session. So, any questions? Yeah, can we introduce yes, this of book? Course, of course, yeah. Ahmedullah, please so, come up and say a few so words. Give a big hand to Mr. Ahmedullah, who organized this event today. I think some of you know us and some of you don't. I'm from Brickland Circle. Um, Yo, do you want to sit? No, no, you sit. You sit. I'm from Brick Brick but you're very quiet. You're a very soft face. Some of you uh, know me and some of you don't. I'm from Brickland Circle. And uh, recently we produced uh, this book. This was our first uh, venture into um, using you know, fiction writing as a way of learning, learning history. Uh, I won't say too much about the details, but we have been um, you know, doing some uh, events and, and projects and, and you know, organizing discussions and seminars um, on East India Company. But like you, um, even when we started to write about Brickland, sorry, by East India Company, sorry, doing project on East India Company, some people say, why are you doing on East India Company? Why not 71, right? Mm. <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, I, I really thought it's really important to understand um, the, the history in a more deeper way, you know, going back uh, yes, longer. Otherwise, you can really uh, understand even Arakani questions. Yeah. Without, um, right. And also, prior to 1666, the involvement of Arakani in Bengal, and you know, they capture you know, people and selling them into slavery and having access to Bengal resources. I read one report for one piece of historical writing. Is that uh, at one time, I think uh, in 1640s, 1639 or 41, Arakani army invaded Bengal, came near, near, <coughs> near Dhaka, and on the way back, they, they kidnapped about 80,000 Bengalis, uh, weavers, mostly weavers, right, yeah, and their families because they tried to recreate a weaving industry in Morao, in the capital of Arakan. Ah. Uh, but then uh, they couldn't organize the logistics, and people you know, couldn't just fit in. You couldn't, in all the processes, all the system, it's really difficult. And a lot of them died of starvation, uh, and it didn't, it didn't work, right? And Arakan uh, was built, you know, his strength, his strong state, his district for several centuries, was built on the wealth uh, of Bengal, you know, the access to resources, mm. the rice, and, uh, and the textile uh, they had ending from slaves and, 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 and so on. Uh, but, but this was our first uh, historical fiction writing uh, using historical fiction, our fiction as a way of learning history. Mm -hmm. We had such a you know, uh, big interest from a wide range of people. Our youngest was 21 who joined, and the oldest was 69. Lovely. Um, we, we got more people to join than we originally had our target. Um, but what happened? Uh, so what? So what, what happened? Um, you know, during, during the project, right? Yeah, you know, we, we took people to British Library, to all the different museums that have you know information and objects to do with East India Company, National American Museum, VNA, uh, also London Metropolitan Archives got information on East India Company. They store different kinds of information. And I decided, why don't I write one? I've never written fiction before. Uh, only you know, fiction that I tried when I was in primary school. Oh. 
All right. Yeah, so well done. Uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't figure out how you actually write fiction, how you, you know, create uh, characters and how you sort of, um, you know, generate discussion and conversation and, and the atmosphere. Yeah, and you know yeah. this, right? So, uh, then I thought I read some, uh, some pages of some book, how they start. I read some pages of uh, Amitabh Ghosh, you know, books, uh -huh. Jane Austen. I try and get some, but I still don't love when you read my chapter. <laughs> uh, but it's really what I found is, uh, you know, trying to um, use fiction as a way of uh, exploring history. It's really, really, very. It, it, it helps. Uh, it, it's very rich. You know, the process, the outcome, you know, what you gain. So what I try to do is to write the <coughs> uh, my hist my my story is based on the sixth boil of the East India Company. They left London in 1610, okay. right? and Captain Middleton was the general of three ships right, oh. that left London. And this was also the first expedition when East India Company built ships. Before previous five voyages were um, uh, consisted of ships that were leased or bought by East India Company. Oh, okay. But in 1607, they set up a shipyard you know, in Deptford, to the other side. And the first uh, two ships that came out of the production line okay. was called uh, Peppercorn and Trades Increase. The third one was the boat, right? But at that time, Trades Increase was the biggest ship England ever built. Okay. Right? Thousands. Right? So, uh, no, it was more than thousand, right? Yeah. right? Um, but also, the interesting thing is that, that the first expedition that went to Arabia, Mecca, and the captain got captured when he landed in Mecca, the invitation mm. of the Turkish, according to the captain. Oh. Yeah. And then he spent se seven months in captivity. He was taken to Sana. Oh. And there's lots of uh, interesting information, but they're all from the English side, so we don't really know. Ah, if they're interesting. True, you know? uh, <laughs> the church will do that. <laughs> <laughs> but just to the point that I was trying to make, right, is that for my, my story is set in when the ship got destroyed uh, on the shores of an Indonesian island in Java, you know, near Bantan. And the island is called Pula Panja. <coughs> So when I was reading uh, the accounts of the captain, because you can go to British Library and find online as well, um, you know, um, journals and oh, wow. writings and letters Lovely. in this right, yeah? um, And they describe, you know, about what the local people were like, you know, what they wore, you know, what they ate and, and how savage some of them were and, and so on, and their beliefs and, and, and so on. Um, so then I couldn't sort of, I found it very difficult to try and um, describe or or kind of build a story that that kind of um, um, you know um, the context that the land you know right yeah? mm -hmm. describe not the land and w w you know when the captain at seven o'clock was looking on the you know, towards the mainland what it might look like you know, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. all these things so I actually went there you know oh wow Japan, right? okay yeah. great I stayed with the local family nice right? uh, and I saw the sunset you know. Right? Wow from the island and I could see what, what he the had seen. mainland looks like, you know, and the mountains on the mainland and the city of Anton there. And, and so then I could, but what I didn't know is um, which part of the island, was it on the east or on the west, or the south or the north, where the English set up this temporary, uh, like a little village, what they call, um, to clean their ships and, and repair mm. before they go back. Okay. So I had to think, you know, logically because there's no records. Right. Like exactly where it was. So I could be totally wrong, but this is uh, this is fiction. But I try to be as accurate as possible historically <laughs> and filled in sort of gap. But what I found, just trying to you know imagine what might have happened and how I should develop this uh, story further and trying to be as accurate as possible. Uh, so fiction is a very good way of uh, actually learning, uh, uh, you know, learning history. This is from my experience. Um, but pe people who read, read on love because this is my first attempt at fiction. Right? <laughs> 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 oh, no, do, do you feel like you have both a responsibility to the authenticity of the history, yeah. but the beauty of fiction is that things that you don't know, as a writer, creatively, you can fill in gaps. Yeah, how, how I look at it, right, is we had this debate in the group. Some people really didn't want to do the research. <laughs> he, wanted, he wanted to make up completely, and I, <laughs> I, 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 I barred him from doing that. 
believe in research. <laughs> but I also believe in creativity. Yeah. No, no, no. Balance, yeah. Now what happens, Saye, mm -hmm. is uh, because we wanted people to, this project is about learning, uh, you know, about East India Company, about history, right? So we didn't want people to sort of, uh, what's the word, um, go too fast, right? Mm -hmm. Make th too many mm -hmm. things up, Saye. Right. Um, but, but then, you know, um, it's so fiction it's and it's people have right. to imagine a lot of things. Like, for example, I made up a lot of things. But what I made up, uh, I think, plausible. Right. Context. Plausible. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I, uh, anyway, so this is, uh, so I would encourage, and we've been, people have been asking when, when are you going to do the next one? And more people want to write fiction now. Nice. Well done. We've got another project coming up. From this one, we develop another one. It's a small project. It's, it's uh, focused uh, solely on objects kept at uh, Cloth Workers Center. It's in near Olympia. Um, but this is the storehouse of Victoria and Albert Museum. If you go there, you'll see amazing things there. So we'll be starting a project where we'll take whoever joins, and you'll see some object, and you have to write something. Oh, nice. Right, yeah. I like that. Yeah, really, thank you for coming. Thank really you so you much right for here. making this happen. Uh, you know, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmadullah Bhai. Just one thing, right? Yeah? This book is free. You will all get free, but you have to buy it. Uh, <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs>